for this event in our Environmentalist and Residence series. My name is Joanna Kerr. I'm a librarian with London Public Library. We will be recording the session, as I mentioned, and we'll send you the recording after our event. We would like to take this time together today to acknowledge that we in London, Ontario are speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, Lunapayuk, and neutral peoples. This land is covered by several treaties, including Treaty 6, the London Township Treaty of 1796. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples endure in Canada. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and we thank the generations of peoples who have taken care of this land. Together and going forward, may we all recognize our own responsibility in the stewardship of this land. If you would like to read or learn more about Treaty 6, the library holds materials on this and other treaties. Thank you for reflecting on this acknowledgement. So today, for our program, our environmentalist in residence, Dr. Andrea Boyer, uh, is in conversation with Paul Gross from NBC Detroit. And we'll also hear from Pat Donnelly from the City of London. And we'll be screening this week's video of one of London's environmentally significant areas and featuring local groups that you can connect with. And we want to hear your questions, which you can type into the chat box at any time during our program. We'll be drawing prizes after our program tonight uh, for a rain barrel, a composter, as well as gift cards from Green Economy London businesses. I may check with you in the chat or my fellow librarian, Lily, there she is, um, who's helping out behind and in front of the scenes, uh, may check in with you if we don't have contact information from your registration list, um, from our registration list based on your Zoom screen name. I want to thank our partners. Uh, this program would not be possible without the support of the Houston Family Foundation. And we thank the City of London for their ongoing support and partnership in this program, including supplying uh, some of the prizes for our events. And now I'll introduce our 2021 environmentalist in residence, Dr. Andrea Boyer. Um, Andrea holds a PhD in biology with a specialization in environment and sustainability. Her graduate research looked at how changing weather patterns can affect the physiology and behavior of birds. Andrea is now a professor at Fanshawe College and an assistant professor at Western University. She has contributed her expertise for five years with the Environmental and Ecological Planning Advisory Committee that provides technical advice to the City of London on environmentally significant projects. She also volunteers with BirdSafe, UWO, the Bird Friendly City Team, and Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup Events. I'll hand it over to Andrea. Thanks, Joanna. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon to discuss the local impl implications of climate change. This morning, looking out my window, I've seen rain, followed by snow, followed by sleet, followed by a little bit of sun. And now I think we're back to, to overcast conditions. So we certainly have a wide variety of weather conditions to, to chat about today. Just last week, I'm sure many of you were as well, we were out in shorts and a t-shirt. So London has definitely been seeing some interesting weather patterns indeed. Right now, I'd like to introduce um, our guests for this session today. First, we have Pat Donnelly. Pat is the Watershed Program Manager for the City of London, and he's also been a member of the team preparing the Climate Emergency Action Plan here in London, and we're going to hear from Pat a little bit later today. Paul Gross, we also are lucky enough to have joining us today. Paul is a meteorologist at NBC News Detroit, which if you tune into your NBC station, we get here in London. He's also a former mentor of mine when I interned with him at the news station many, many years ago. Paul is only one of six meteorologists in the world to ever be named a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, as well as an American Meteorological Society certified consulting meteorologist and certified broadcast meteorologist. 
He has been awarded nine Emmy Awards by the Michigan chapter of the National Association of Television Arts and Sciences. Paul's, Paul follows the science of global warming very carefully and frequently gives lectures to share the scientific truth about Earth's climate change, which we're lucky enough to hear about today. As a historian, Paul spent about three and a half years researching the weather and how it actually impacted D-Day in World War II. And the documentary that he wrote and produced received international recognition as an important historical work, which is really interesting. Paul also consults in the legal field and has testified in court as a meteorology expert witness. Very impressive. So with that introduction, we'd like to start our In Conversation series with Paul now. Welcome, Paul. So nice to see you, Andrea. It, it's been many years since Paul and I have, have been together when I, I, as I mentioned, interned with him. I think it was 10 or 12 years ago at this point now. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I was lucky enough to, to intern there. Paul really played a big role in the tra trajectory of my academic life, getting me sort of involved with the meteorology aspect side of, of my education. Of course, my PhD in biology uh, centered around uh, climate change research. So your bio, Paul, really tells us this, how passionate you are about meteorology. So first, we're going to uh, jump off our in conversation here and ask what inspired you to really get into meteorology? Well, you know, Andrea, it actually began when I was a real little child. I was terrified of thunderstorms. I mean, put three pillows over my head, you know, climb under the bed, you know. I mean, I was really scared of storms. And then uh, when I was about seven years old, my teacher at school took me to the school library because she noticed during a thunder shower that I was nervous in class. And she pointed out a section of books about weather and said, you know, maybe if you read about thunder and lightning, you'll understand them more and they'll become a little less scary. And by the end of that school year, not only did that happen, but I became more interested in them. And then at the end of uh, that grade, uh, a family member asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a weatherman at Channel 4. And that's what I'm doing today. <laughs> Pretty amazing how, how one person can have such a, a big impact on on the trajectory of your life, really. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure you have very fond memories of uh, thinking back to to that grade during school, so you've you've done a lot with respect to um, research and and meteorological endeavors. Really, when we talk about your bio, and if some of us here are lucky enough to have seen some of your webcasts, we know that communicating science, effective science, is so important to you. So maybe you can touch on uh, why communicating science is so important, especially in this realm of, of climate change that we're dealing with. Yeah, a realm of climate change and also a realm of disinformation. And yes. I have always, always made a, a a, a, a pledge to my viewers, and I've repeated this on the air many times, that I do not accept any information from advocacy groups. And so I am a scientist, and all I want to do is explain science to people. I love to teach. And so if I can make science interesting, like right now, I'm having a lot of fun with this Mars mission, and, and I'm doing almost daily reports on that Perseverance rover up there, and, and people are just fascinated by it. So I get such great personal satisfaction when I can bring science to people in a way that not only do they understand it, but it excites them as well. And it's the same thing with climate change and with meteorology. I love to explain, love to teach this science. Yeah, that's amazing. And if any of you have a, a Twitter account, this is sort of a plug that I'm just personally adding here. Paul has a, a great Twitter account where uh, he's always reporting on, on really unique and interesting stories uh, and also um, chatting about new research that's coming out and, and also sometimes explaining to people why their opinion on uh, what's happening within the climate change world may or may not be, be accurate. So lots of climate communication that um, Paul is, is very invested in. So you obviously report within Detroit. We're a little bit farther away from Detroit, but not too far. We're still all still uh, within this, this Great Lakes region though. So um, I'll ask you, what do you think we should focus on within our Great Lakes region to 
tackle climate change? Well, you know, Andrea, the, the, the single thing that we need to do, and I'll explain it later when I do my presentation as to why we need to do this, but we basically need to cut back on the amount of electricity we use and the amount of driving we do. And when I say cut back in the amount of driving, that doesn't mean you necessarily have to drive less, but just drive more fuel efficiently and, and drive a more fuel efficient car because the less gas we burn, the less emissions we put in the atmosphere. And it's the same thing with electricity. Many power plants are coal burning power plants, not all, but many of them are. And the less electricity we use, the less that they have to burn that coal in order to produce the electricity for us. So it's basically kind of like leading a kind of a cleaner lifestyle, which in some respects can actually save us money. That's the funny thing. We can actually save money and help do our part for climate change all at the same time. Yeah, I think that relationship between saving money, saving energy, and making an impact on climate change is, is something that we, we really need to focus on. Um, I think sometimes when we're talking about climate change in the general public, um, it the more important thing is is that component of saving energy, which it, it shouldn't necessarily be our main focus, right? But if it ends up being that main focus, the most the thing that most people care about, it's still going to have a positive impact when we're we're talking about climate change. That's so, certainly true. Yeah, um, maybe you can can touch on. Uh, I don't know if you have a list. So I'm kind of throwing this at Paul off the spot here. Maybe a, a top five thing that that we can do at a local level, because we hear about a lot of things that need to happen with greenhouse gases at this really large global scale. What's maybe a, a top three or a top five list other than simply just um, driving less as as something that as a meteorology expert that we can do? Well, you talk about addressing climate change, correct? Correct. Yes. Well, I've, I've already mentioned two, and that is driving more fuel efficiently or driving. And by the way, I practice what I preach. I have a, a Chevy Bolt. It's an all electric car. So I do practice what I preach. But uh, whatever you can do to, to use less gas and less electricity, those are certainly two things. But something else you can do is you can plant trees on the side of the house. It gets, for example, the western sun in the afternoons because that shade will help cool your home a bit and you'll use your air conditioning less. And thing, other things that are simple is like in the summer, when you, if you have air conditioning, you know, dialing up your thermostat a degree or two. And in the winter, dialing it down a degree or two. Because again, the less you use your furnace, the less electricity that you're using. So that's another thing that you can do. And here is uh, another one that I love. And again, practicing what I preach uh, in reducing your electricity uh, usage, replacing your light bulbs with LED light bulbs, replacing those standard incandescent light bulbs with LED light bulbs. I've done that throughout my house and understand that you can get the same amount of light from an LED light bulb as a regular incandescent bulb, but it uses like, I think it's 75 or 80% less electricity. And that's simply by changing the light bulb you use. And then things like turning off lights when you leave a room. It don't just leave lights sitting on in a room for 45 minutes, you're just burning electricity that you're not using. Yeah, lots of really small, simple things that it, when we think about it, changing that human behavior, if we're doing it at a large enough scale, that is when when we start to see a, a big enough impact. Sure. So, Paul, now I'm going to invite you to, to share your screen. Paul's going to give us a, a presentation, which will be a little bit more informative and, and technical relating to these impacts that we're seeing as a result of climate change. <clears throat> and excuse me, because I'm fighting some allergies here. So let me start this. Uh, there we go. Okay, so uh, I've got until about uh, 1230 to do this. And so uh, I've kind of cut down a lecture that I give on climate change. And uh, what I want to start with is explaining the greenhouse effect, because there are three main things that dictate a planet's average temperature. So number one is how close it is to its star. And in our case, how close we are to the sun. Number two is what's called its surface albedo, which is actually a, a fancy scientific term to say its surface color. And you know how this works in the summer. We tell you to wear light colored clothing because for example, white repels more or, or reflects more solar radiation than dark colors like black. 
And in the winter, it's the opposite. Darker colors will absorb those, those solar rays and maybe warm you up a little more. So the darker a planet is, the more it absorbs that solar radiation. And then the lighter the color of the planet, the less it absorbs. So that's number one and number two. The third thing is the composition of its atmosphere, because there are some gases that trap heat. Okay, so you got your distance from the sun, you've got the color of the planet, and you've got the composition of your atmosphere. And by the way, if we didn't have an atmosphere, our average temperature on this planet would be zero. So we need these greenhouse gases to have life as we know it on Earth. The problem is, is that humans have actually physically changed the composition of our planet's atmosphere by adding uh, an enormous amount of carbon dioxide. And by the way, don't let anybody tell you that this science of climate change is this some recent uh, initiative by people. No, this science was established way back in the 1800s. In 1863, John Tyndall actually postulated that doubling carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would warm the Earth's surface. And then in 1895, Svantarinius actually made a specific prediction, a calculation, and he said that the Arctic would warm by 15 degrees Fahrenheit if carbon dioxide increased two to three times in the atmosphere. And by the way, at the time that Arrhenius made this prediction, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was 295 parts per million. As you'll see in a minute, right now we are well over 400, okay? So he was actually correct. All right, a lot of people like to say, oh, this is some natural cycle, this warming we have right now. No, it's not. Yes, the earth has been warm in the past, but every single one of those previous warmings were all determined to be the result of astronomical changes. Things like our orbit around the sun called our eccentricity of our orbit or the tilt, the change in our tilt or the precession or the wobbling of our axis. Those are all astronomical things that caused all of those previous warmings. None of this is currently happening, okay? All right, so let's kind of reconstruct the past and look at carbon dioxide. And we're going all the way back 800,000 years on this graph. So if you go back onto the left side there, the very left, you see that's 800,000 years ago. And you see ups and downs, which nobody's ever not said that carbon dioxide has not fluctuated in our planet's history. But notice, going back 800,000 years, our carbon dioxide was never above around 300 parts per million. And then you go to the far right and you look at that, it's an exponential increase that just hasn't stopped. We're now over 400 parts per million and the most it's ever been was around 300 uh, parts per million. And that was like 400,000 years ago. So you can see how unnatural this additional amount of carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. The only thing that has changed in all that time is that humans have started combusting, in other words, burning fossil fuels. And so that's the proximate cause for the planet's warming because we have increased the amount of those heat trapping gases in the atmosphere. Nobody, nobody can look you in the eye and say that humans have not changed the composition of our planet's atmosphere. All right, if you're wondering where the greenhouse gases are coming from, well, about 29% of it comes from transportation. Uh, 28% we just talked about comes from electricity, 22% from industry, 12% from commercial and residential, and 9% actually comes from agriculture. And part of the solution to the problem is actually teaching farmers how to be more climate friendly in their agriculture practices. And by the way, if anybody tries to ever tell you that there is still a big disagreement about whether the planet's warming and, and that humans are the proximate cause, you tell them that 97% of the world's climate scientists agree about this. And, and by the way, since this study is done, has, was done, I'll bet it's even higher than 97%, but this is the number that was in the study. And 99.9% .9 of the scientific research studies published in the peer-reviewed science journals find that human-caused climate change is happening, okay? So when somebody tells me, tries to tell me that, that there's a big disagreement, we shouldn't be doing anything because there's just too much uncertainty. I tell them these statistics and then I ask them, all right, if 97% and 99% are, 
are not high enough for you, then what does the percentage have to be in order for you to acknowledge that this is true? <laughs> so in any event, this is agreed upon by almost all of the world's climate scientists. All right, now I made this uh, chart last year and uh, I didn't um, update it to include 2020 because I didn't have the uh, time at the end of the year to update this. But basically 2020 finishes, I, th I, th I think uh, depending upon which study you look at, either the second or the third warmest year on record since 1880. So you can put that onto this chart, knock off 2009 there at the far left. And uh, you can see that the 10 hottest years globally on record have all occurred since 2005. Now, if you had one or two or even three since 2005 in the last 15, 16 years, you would say, okay, well, you know, that's a coincidence maybe, but there's no coincidence. And we tell you that, that basically 10 of the past 16 years have been the top 10 warmest year on record. So that is just an extraordinary statement to say that. And by the way, if you're wondering when's the last time that the planet has had a record cold year, that was over a hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago. All right, uh, just because some people uh, try to think that maybe we're cherry picking data from one research group, what you're seeing here, this uh, set of lines here is what the computed planet's average temperature was each year from 1880 to the present by five different groups of researchers working independently of each other, okay? Including NASA and NOAA, and the Hadley Research Center is in England, okay? So you have five different groups, five different groups, and the results of all five of them are nearly identical. So again, when I say that climate scientists are in agreement on all this stuff, here you're seeing right before your eyes, the actual computed results of the world's average temperatures from 1880 to the present, and it's identical independently by five different research groups. All right, it's not just the land and where you and I live that's heating up, the oceans are heating up as well. Look at this change in sea surface temperature since 1901. The oranges and, and reddish colors are the warmer than average or, or a positive change, if you will. In other words, a, an increase in ocean surface temperature and the blues are the uh, decreases. And by the way, you notice that one, can you see my cursor? I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but this little area here off the southeast tip of Greenland, we think that that cool area is because of the melting ice pack, the ice sheet on Greenland. That water, of course, is cool coming off the uh, continent there. We think that that uh, little bullseye of cool water off of Greenland is from the melting ice sheet on Greenland. And by the way, all this extra heat that we're building up in the atmosphere, 93% of it is going into the oceans. So imagine. We are so lucky that three quarters of our planet's surface is ocean. Because let's say instead of three quarters, let's say only half of our surface was ocean and the other half was land. Well, that would be less ocean to take up the warmth and the land would be where you and I live would be heating up even faster. So the oceans are kind of saving us a little bit for now. I mean, we're still warming at a very unnatural rate and we're seeing changes in the weather patterns, but it'd be even worse if we had less ocean surface here. All right, let's look at sea level rise since we're talking about the oceans. This goes back 2,000 years, and each bar represents a century's sea level, okay? So sea level for a particular century. And yeah, you see there are fluctuations. There are ups and there are downs, but then you look at what happened to the 20, in the 20th century. There is nothing close to the amount of change that we've seen here in the 20th century going back 2,000 years. So I'll leave it up to you to decide whether that's just coincidence or whether that is a result of the warming of the climate. And by the way, I will tell you that sea level rise, about two thirds of it is from the melting glacial ice for, for example, like the Greenland ice or the Antarctica uh, ice sheet melting. Okay, that's two thirds of it. You know what the other third is? The other third of sea level rise is simply the fact that the oceans are warming because as the water warms, it expands. That's a very interesting quality about water. As it warms, it expands. And that's part of the fact that uh, is causing our sea levels to rise. All right, this, oh, you know what I want to do? I want to stop this. <laughs> I forgot that I have the ability to stop this. Okay, this is uh, Arctic ice starting in 2000. Now, two things I want you to notice here at the start. 
you see that, first of all, geographically, the, the amount of ice here. And second, you notice all those white colors, those lighter white colors, and maybe that kind of a dirty yellowish color, that is older ice. And that's important because older ice melts slower than new ice. Okay, now I'm gonna put this in motion here and take a look at what happened over the next, uh, I think it's about 15 years. Okay, this is uh, satellite data showing the, uh, the North Pole ice pack. Uh, you noticing anything? So look at this. So I'm gonna, what I'll do is I'll pop it back to the beginning. So look at all this old ice, that bright white. And then also notice not only a lot less ice, but notice a lot less of the old ice. So there are a lot of climate scientists that think that this Arctic could become during the summer completely ice free in the decades ahead, which would be absolutely extraordinary. I can't even comprehend that. All right, let's get back to our Great Lakes, get back to local. And uh, listen, Great Lakes are important to us. So first of all, let's talk about ice cover and what each dot for each year on this graph represents is the point in each winter where we had the peak ice cover. In other words, the, the greatest extent of ice on the Great Lakes. And you'll notice that there is tremendous fluctuation from year to year, of course, you would expect that, but the overall trend, which is this yellow line, the overall trend is downward. So we're seeing less maximum ice coverage in the Great Lakes. And there's an important ramification for that. We have our friend Lake Huron that we uh, need to keep an eye on because less lake ice means more potential lake effect snow. And we've had some doozy lake effect snowstorms in the past couple of decades. And you can see here on this graph from 1930 to this one, uh, this study ended at 2017, you can see that lake effect snow is increasing. And that's just the direct ramification of the ice cover uh, diminishing in the winter. You have more open water, that means you have more lake effect snow. All right, let's also talk about extreme precipitation events. Every part of the United States, and of course you and I are in the Northeastern part, you're obviously in Ontario, but I think that could be included on this graph here or this chart here, but we have seen a 42% increase in the heaviest, most extreme precipitation events. In other words, the top 1% precipitation events since 1958. And yes, there are tremendous variations across different regions of the, of the continent here, but our part of the continent where you and I are, Ontario, Quebec, and the Northeastern United States, you can see an increase of 42 or 55% in the most intense precipitation events. So that means heavier rainfall, that could be more flooding. The Thames River, of course, is something that you gotta be careful, a lot of walking paths in there and it's, a, it's, it's an area that's gonna flood. If you get more precipitation events, intense precip precipitation events, there is gonna be a greater potential for that river to be flooding. All right, raise your hand if you have allergies. Actually, I'm full screen here with my thing. I can't see who's raising their hand, but most people have allergies. And we are seeing with the warming of the climate, a longer growing season. And a longer growing season would of course mean a longer allergy season. And here in the Detroit area, and I'm sure it's not very different to there in London, but you can see that from 1970 to 2018, look at this, the growing season is 27 days longer. At least that's the trend on average, it's 27 days longer. So if you have allergies, that's 27 more days of allergies that you have to deal with. I mean, I know a lot of people that have real bad allergies. That first frost in the fall, they're ready to light candles and, and pop champagne whenever that happens. All right, there's something else that's happening. As we increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, remember plants use carbon dioxide as food and turn it into sugars. And so plants that produce pollen in this higher carbon dioxide atmosphere are now producing more pollen. So you can see right now, eh, plants are producing about, oh, about seven and a half uh, I'd say, I think it's about seven and a half grains of pollen, um, seven and a half million uh, grains of pollen per plant. And by 2060, that number has gone from seven and a half to 15, so that's doubled. And by 2085, you're between 20 and 25 million grains of pollen per plant compared to where we are right now, it's seven and a half million. So not only will the allergy season be longer, it's gonna become more intense if you have allergies. 
All right, I'm gonna wrap this up with just a few last uh, slides here. I did my own little study here in the Detroit area. And if you have, and we have a long enough climate record here, it goes back into the 1870s. And so if you had no forcing on the climate, in other words, you had no global warming, no global cooling, no change. It was just a very static, stable climate. It might not be exactly one to one ratio of uh, record warmth and record cold, but it would be, it would be pretty close to an even number of heat and cold records. So I did a study. So I counted the number of record highs, record lows, and all all records that were a temperature record for warmth or cold. I took all those records and counted them. And in the decade of the 1990s, we had a three to one ratio of record heat to record cold. Then in the decade of the 2000s, the last decade, well, technically two decades ago, because this is now 2021, it jumped up to a six to one ratio of record heat to record cold. So three to one was unusual, six to one was extraordinary. And then I just tabulated this morning, the records for the most recent decade, which is 2011 to 2020. And we had 141 warm records, 40 cold records. That's about a three and a half to one ratio. But the thing to keep in mind more than half of these 40 cold records occurred just in two winters. That the Remember the polar vortex winter, we called it, of 2013, 2014? And then the next winter, 2014, 2015, we had two back-to-back -back really cold winters here. And 22 of those 40 cold records occurred in those two winters, okay? So, I mean, those were very extraordinary, unusual winters. And it was only in our part of the country, our part of the, re the region here, the rest of the world and the rest of the country was warm. It was just us that was getting nailed. So real quick, a snowfall uh, in Detroit. And again, I looked at the stats, six of Detroit's top 15 all time snowiest winters have occurred since 2002. Very simple reason for this. When you have a warmer climate, you evaporate more ocean water into the atmosphere. That evaporated water in the atmosphere that it's called atmospheric humidity that is what storms turn into precipitation, okay? And so if you're increasing the amount of atmospheric humidity planetarily, globally, which we are, then you are basically priming storms to be able to dump more precipitation. We just saw that with the, uh, the, the graph, the, the, um, the map I showed earlier with the intense rainfall events, and we're seeing it with snowfall too. And in fact, here in Detroit, uh, the Super Bowl Sunday uh, snowstorm of January 2015, we had our second, I forget, second or third biggest snowstorm in Detroit history, and that's in a warming world. So yes, the warming of the climate can manifest itself in many ways that are unexpected, like this. Uh, last thing I want to show you is people ask me, so is any season warming more than the others? Well, winter is actually the season that is warming the fastest. The other three seasons are close together, but winter is by far outrunning the other seasons uh, in terms of uh, uh, the warming. And so I just wanna remind you that carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. So what we put into the atmosphere right now basically locks us in to all of the things that we've been talking about. So we are, uh, you know, we're kind of playing with fire here and not uh, no pun intended. We're kind of playing with fire here. So uh, with that, I will stop my screen share here and I will send it back over to Andrea and we'll get to listen to Pat, who I'm very, uh, very much looking forward to hearing from. Thank you, Paul. That was that was great. Very insightful. Lots of great images. Um, I, I like our, our local aspect being tied in there. As Paul mentioned, now um, I'd like to reintroduce Pat Donnelly. As a reminder, Pat is the manager of the watershed programs and environmental programs for the City of London. He's going to share a few words with us uh, and relate things a little bit more to our, our local climate. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Um, yeah, and what a what a great introduction to sort of the, uh, the the topics that I just wanted to touch on, and very briefly because I think we'd like to get to. Uh, uh, some questions and answers and i'm sure after uh, uh paul's presentation i'm sure there'll be uh, lots of uh, interesting uh, uh questions but i think if uh, if you wanted to just focus on the four quadrants 
of this uh, slide that I've got up, the bottom left hand corner picks up really nicely from where Paul just left off talking about ice cover on the Great Lakes. Uh, most people I think are familiar with a satellite view. If you go to the weather network and you uh, uh, hit, hit the radar, that's our uh, radar installation just north of London in Exeter. And it shows the map of Southwestern Ontario with the blue and, and green streaks. And certainly this is a specific storm which was referred to as Snowmageddon. For those of you in London that remember 2010, it was a four day snowstorm event, which was basically snow streamers coming off of Lake Huron, which Paul uh, mentioned already. Uh, Lake Huron is really our weather maker because we get Northwest winds and that snow streamer sat over top of London for four days. It dumped something in the order of 177 centimeters of snow it snowed for four days straight. And you may recall it shut down Western University, which is the other uh, image there, the cross country skier in the red uh, uh, sweater. Uh, uh, Fanshawe College, it also shut down our transit system. Uh, City Hall went into um, emergency uh, mode, essential uh, services only. And it is the expectation that as Paul mentioned, we are seeing less and less ice cover on the Great Lakes because of the warming atmosphere as well as the warming lakes, which is another aspect similar to what Paul said about the oceans. We're also seeing the lake temperatures, the average temperatures is increasing as well. So that's the winter aspect. If we go up to the top left hand corner of that red map of southwestern Ontario, which is really the peninsula of uh, southwestern Ontario showing the, the Great Lakes surrounding it, that is an image showing what we're projecting into the future by 2050. That is showing what's called very hot days, very, very technical term, very hot days, any day over 30 degrees. And what we're finding is on average right now, we have about 12 very hot days. And obviously those are in the summertime, July and August. What we're projecting into the future with the current trend of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide is we're gonna see two months of very hot days. So 60 days over 30 degrees. And that is certainly troubling in one aspect, certainly when you think about the, the, the uh, pressures on air conditioning, uh, and, and pressures on, on people that are in high rise apartments that perhaps have uh, no windows to open. And uh, if there are power outages, those are the types of concerns that we're building into our considerations here in London with regards to the, the future climate and, and what we need to respond to. The other thing I'll just mention is the evenings probably will not cool down as much as they have in the past, something called tropical nights. And that's something where the temperature does not dra drop down below uh, 20 degrees, and that's what's referred to as a tropical night. Now, the two photos on the right side, top right and bottom right, are, uh, again, Paul very nicely alluded to. Uh, flooding is certainly something that we're already finding, and these are two historic floods. The top right is in 2014. That was in September, and that was a, a flood that uh, uh, basically buried um, or flooded uh, Queens Avenue with the uh, gentleman in the green canoe uh, canoeing down the street. Uh, that uh, shut down Western Fair, uh, which happens in the fall, as you may know, uh, and is that's referred to as urban flooding or pluvial flooding. And that's where the storm sewers just cannot accommodate the amount of rain that is coming down in downpours. The bottom right hand corner is another uh, interesting one. It's a different flooding event. And for those of you that recognize Waltzing Weasel Pub at the corner of uh, Windermere and Adelaide Street. That's the flooding that surrounds the Waltzing Weasel area because it is in the floodplain of the Thames River. And that flood was something in the order of, that was a, uh, of February 22nd, so it was a winter flood. And as uh, Paul mentioned, our winters are becoming uh, warmer and warmer. And for that reason, we're finding floods in the winter much more common. Uh, this was in 2018. You may also recall 2019, we had a similar flood. But in this case, we had Wonderland Road was overtopped with, with rain, and that's not something that uh, we've ever had to close Wonderland Road as well. So certainly those are some expectations now that we're having to realize we have to adapt to. And certainly the adaptation and the mitigation are the two types that we need to look at when we talk about climate change. And that's what we're doing in London. Uh, as Andrea mentioned, I'm part of the Climate Emergency Action Team that is looking at the uh, uh, climate emergency, which our council uh, declared back in 2019. And the next slide shows 
what we've set up for engagement. And this was uh, something that we had to do because of the pandemic. We usually we'd be out at the uh, summer festivals with you celebrating and, and uh, providing information at information booths. We'd be at the, the home show. But of course, because of the pandemic, we're not able to do that. So we've set up this Get Involved London website. And on that website, you'll find a, a ton of information and a ton of ways of engaging. And the one I'll just mention is we actually have a, just a two page quick uh, summary, which is in five different languages. And that's something that if you or, or, or folks that you know are interested in helping uh, provide that information to others, uh, again, this website has that information on it. It also has an email address for those people that are wanting to provide information. And we do have various ways. Uh, there's a two minute survey, I think a 10 minute survey uh, that takes 10 minutes. Uh, we also have a discussion primer, which is in much more detail. And uh, the next slide actually talks about two tools that are on that uh, website. One is called the Climate Action Plan Simulator. And that one's a really interesting tool just because it actually provides you the, uh, the opportunity to create an action plan. So as Paul mentioned, if we were all to drive uh, electric vehicles, that simulator allows you to say, okay, if 100% of the people in London drove electric or hybrid vehicles, what impact would that have on greenhouse gases? It also talks about uh, retrofitting houses. I noticed Bob's on the on, on our webinar today, and I know he and I were just chatting about that after the 2040 film that was recently uh, produced or uh, uh, hosted by our Climate um, Action London group. And certainly um, re retrofitting buildings. If if 50% of our old buildings in London got retrofitted, what would that uh, how what impact would that have on on the uh, on the plans to get to net zero? greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, which is one of our targets. The second tool I'll just mention briefly is our carbon footprint pool, uh, tool, which is called Project Neutral. And it allows you to look at your own household and figure out uh, where the greenhouse gases are coming from and how to reduce that. And in London, our greenhouse gases come from two main issues. One is our personal vehicle use. And that's something again that uh, Paul's already mentioned. Uh, going from uh, uh, electric is maybe a little expensive right now in Ontario without any type of a, an incentive, but certainly hybrids is another opportunity. Uh, and then the other, the other aspect is our energy being used in our households both for uh, air conditioning in the summer and heating in the winter. And in, in, uh, in Ontario, we, we have a fairly clean uh, energy grid because of uh, uh, being mostly nuclear. However, uh, old uh, coal-fired energy plants have been uh, closed up, and certainly that's something that uh, we we expect and hope that the future will continue because we we are definitely looking for alternative energy sources to ensure that we are keeping a clean energy grid. But the less energy you use, obviously, the less expensive it is as well. So my last little bit is a, a, a world premiere of a video, it takes a minute and a half, and it gives you an idea that we're still wanting your engagement, we're still wanting your comments, but we're wanting them before the end of the month, because we're closing uh, the first round of engagement uh, by uh, uh, Earth Day, uh, and certainly that's something that uh, you'll see we've already uh, got a lot of good information from, uh, from our public, from the citizens, but we're encouraging you to, to continue that uh, discussion and uh, basically add more uh, comments and, and information that uh, will help us build the community energy action, uh, uh, the uh, climate action plan. And certainly that is something over the summer with the next round of engagement, hopefully by uh, next fall. So roll them, Woody. I'm not hearing any... Uh, any sound on that, but we do have closed captioning on. Get involved at london.ca slash climate. It's like your own personal digital town square. Woohoo, fancy. You can share honest opinions on city projects and make sure the city staff hear you loud and clear. We know it ain't easy being green, so we want you to tell us exactly what you feel should be in the CEAP, the Climate Emergency Action Plan. Your ideas, both big and small, can help London. So take a look, leave a comment, and stay a while if you like. But act fast, this is a limited time offer. We've collected lots of great feedback on the CEAP so far. 
Have you shared your input yet? We've heard about city improving projects like green bins, walkable neighborhoods, buying local, recycling, urban agriculture, protected bike lanes, electrifying transit, more energy efficient homes, collaboration with First Nations communities, climate change education, and so much more. Oh, what a list. Have anything to add? Make sure you share it with us. From Huron Heights to Hyde Park, Westminster to Wardley, and Oak Ridge to the OEV, we want the poorest city to be ready and prepared for climate change. And we all need to be ambitious. So step up and have your say about the Climate Emergency Action Plan at getinvolved.london.ca slash climate today. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Pat. Um, great. Okay. So we have heard um, from uh, Paul, from Pat, and what we're going to do now is to hear from you. So let's take your questions. I see we already have uh, several. So what I will do is read them out to our guests and have them uh, share their thoughts. All right, let's get into it. So we have a question. Are there particular examples of insects or pests that are now present in southwestern Ontario that weren't previously, either because of expanded range or, or winters, not being too cold enough to kill them off. Um, have there been any studies of ecological damage or financial costs related to this? So let's start with that part of the question. I think I can, can probably touch on this a little bit. Maybe Pat uh, can follow up potentially uh, with a more London specific component. Um, one thing that is sort of running rampant within London right now is those gypsy moths. So that is sort of in in combination of, of different weather patterns that we're seeing. This is a really common thing where a lot of pests and diseases are able to move more northward uh, a lot easier. So a lot of our pests and diseases usually require fairly warm temperatures. So this is definitely confirmed that we are seeing um, sort of that creeping northward range of a lot of insects and, and diseases. Um, one example that's kind of ironic that we have Paul here is an example of oak wilt. So oak wilt, wilt this is a, a fungal pathogen. Um, it's sort of actually you can read information about it on the the city of london website this is something that we sort of have our eyes on um, as i mentioned it's a it's a fungal pathogen it hasn't yet although i'm sure this this is information from last year um, it's sort of right on bell isle which is sort of as as close as you can get to windsor as you possibly can and again this is a fungal disease which is going to have this huge impact on oak trees just like we saw the emerald ash borer uh, killing off all of our ash trees so this is just one example that comes to mind um, this fungal pathogen that's going to attack our oak trees it's it's very likely going to spread um, and again temperature and climate conditions have a really big impact on that actual spread. Yeah, that's a great example. And I just add one more, uh, Andrea, the uh, uh, ticks uh, that uh, are, are moving north because of uh, we're not getting the cold winters and, and therefore they're allowed to uh, move further north and, and be uh, uh, over winter, I guess. And those ticks are certainly the ones that are of concern. Uh, there's a number of different types of ticks. I don't have the specific name on this one, but it is one that carries Lyme disease. And that's certainly something that the health unit has been uh, identifying and tracking and is something that is being considered as part of the Climate Emergency Action Plan. All right, thanks so much. And there was another question. Um, about uh, this one, I think would be for you, Paul. Uh, so it's about a reluctance. Um, is there a reluctance to say that a particular weather event was caused by climate change? So climate versus weather. Um, and the question is, are we at a point in time where we can now in real time describe them as climate caused? Well, there is a science that's called climate attribution. And so in other words, we're trying to attribute whether the warming climate is impacting our weather and we're finding that it is. And the easiest way to explain this is to be using a baseball example. And I don't know if anybody here is a baseball fan. I'm a huge baseball fan, but here in the United States in our major leagues, we went through a period where we had some players that started using steroids, anabolic steroids, which made them 
bigger and stronger. And these uh, guys uh, started hitting more home runs. So it's not that they weren't great baseball players already. They were hitting home runs before the steroid usage, but the steroid usage made them stronger and they were now hitting the ball farther. So some home runs they hit previously might have still been home runs, but some of the balls that they might have hit maybe to the back of the outfield that would have been caught for an out now are going farther and we're going as home runs. So what we've done with the atmosphere by trapping more heat, we've basically have put the atmosphere on steroids. So in the same way that I can tell you that we maybe we have this tremendous flooding event. Well, of course we've had tremendous flooding events in the past, but climate change, the warming of the climate in particular could have made this one worse. So for example, uh, I don't know if any of you remember Hurricane Harvey, which hit the Texas coast, I think it was three years ago, if I remember correctly. And that, that storm dropped an extraordinary amount of rain. In fact, I got to convert to centimeters here. Uh, let's see. It was about, I think it was about 135-ish centimeters of rain. Think about that for a minute, okay? Over about a five-day period. And the scientists have actually attributed that biblical amount of rain that fell. Part of that was a response to the warming of the climate. So you can't just say we had this big storm because of global warming. But what you can say is if it was a particularly high end, you know, one of the worst ever types of storms, you can say that global warming likely, it didn't cause the storm, but global warming likely made the storm worse. So that's how we can attribute. Thanks, Paul. That's very clear. And I do like a baseball example. That's great. Um, so uh, we only have about another minute or two for questions, but um, this one goes to all of our guests, uh, Paul and Pat, as well as Andrea. So this is a pretty dire situation. Can you share some optimism? Yeah, can I start off on that one? Just because, and again, I've, I've already referenced this once. I know uh, Bob's sitting here in the, on the call as well. Uh, there's a movie called 2040. And it is a movie that is basically indicating that all the, all the methods that we need to uh, address climate change are available to us now. It's just, are we willing to make those the, the paradigm shift? And we talk about our, our vehicle use and everything else. The other one I'll mention is on the London Environmental Network's website. And it was a, a, a webinar uh, called Hope Matters. And it was a lady by the name of uh, Ellen Kelsey. And she is a psychiatrist and has written on the topic of eco-anxiety. And on that uh, webinar, uh, she provides a number of references of places where you can go to get positive news um, uh, information about things that are happening. Uh, like uh, Texas's uh, electrical grid is is moving very quickly to um, hydro or sorry uh, wind power, and I mean you know and uh, there's there's good news stories that just aren't being uh, necessarily covered as much as all the disaster stories because. Uh, one could argue that the media likes disasters because it gets more attention. So there is a lot of, uh, of hope. And I guess locally, and I'm just going to point to my background here, I guess I got to point the right direction. The West London Dyke, which is that large wall on the other side of Harris Park when you're downtown, uh, maybe at the Rock the Park uh, uh, concert, uh, that, that large wall is, is actually a flood dike, which is being raised and being raised for the the, the, the anticipation of larger floods. And that's something that's been in, in London since the 1930s. But we are now realizing the value of it in the, in the near future with, with climate change and the amount of flooding. So even locally, there are good news stories. And we at the city have not done a great job in explaining those. And that, again, is part of the Climate Emergency Action Plan that we'll be preparing is actually making sure that we connect the dots so people understand the work that's being done at our wastewater treatment plants, the work that's being done with Dyke. So there is good news out there and I really appreciate that question being asked. Andrea, did you want to jump in or are we- Oh yeah, Paul, right jump in, up? yeah. I'll make it very brief. And again, more of the impacts from global warming are gonna be negative than positive, but there are some positives. And for example, for, for Canada in particular, 
Uh, for the past 100, 120 years, the central United States was basically considered the breadbasket of the world. Well, if that gets more arid and, and hotter, uh, the more uh, favorable temperate zone for crops may shift northward and eventually someday it could end up being in southern Canada. So that, that's just that, that's, a, that's a negative for the central United States, but perhaps a positive for southern Canada. And uh, you also look at milder winters would mean maybe lower heating costs, although you'll have higher air conditioning costs in the summer. But of course, we don't use the air conditioning as much in the summer as you use the heat in the winter. But still, lower heating costs in the winter, some people would consider that a positive. But there are just many, many, many more negatives. And I haven't even gotten into a half of it here in, in this uh, time that we've had today. But a lot more negatives than positives. But there are a few uh, small positives. Yeah, I think the final note here is, um, and even the the goal of of what we're doing within this program is is sort of learn something, see something, share something. So you're getting a lot of great information here about what you can do. Our city of London is has our our climate emergency action plan taken into effect. It's really important for us to elect officials that care about climate change. Um, a lot of individual behavioral impacts. Um, it, it is a very dire situation, but there's a lot of positive things that we can do to, to hopefully reprimand some of that. Yeah. Thanks, Andrea. And thanks everybody for your questions. Um, I'm noticing we're a little later than we were planning to be right now. So um, stick with us. We're just gonna end a few minutes after one o'clock. But um, what we'll do now is um, just one, one more thank you to all of our guests, because uh, not only for the great information you shared, but, um, but for the answers to the questions. Um, and please, again, in the chat, if you have more questions, we'll try um, to get those answered. And of course, Andrea is answering questions throughout the month through our library website. So now um, we're going to shift um, and I'm gonna hand it back to Andrea to introduce our next segment. Yes, yeah, so hopefully you'll stick around. We're going to preview our weekly virtual environmentally significant area or ESA visit. So as some of you know already, each event throughout the month of April, I'm visiting an ESA within London and showing you some of those unique features that I find at the ESA. Our goal here is really just to highlight those amazing ESAs that we have in London and also encourage you to participate in our Environmentalist in Residence April Challenge, which I'll explain more in the video. So stay tuned and I'll, I'll share my virtual visit from this week. Hi everybody, it's your environmentalist in residence, Dr. Andrea Boyer. This program is through the London Public Library in collaboration with the City of London. As you hopefully have seen by now, we're doing a bunch of these virtual visits to ESA to help encourage you to get out to ESAs uh, on your own and complete our April challenge. For those of you not familiar with our April challenge, we're just encouraging you to visit as many environmentally significant areas as you can. Upload your photo to social media with the hashtag LDNESA, and you'll be entered in for opportunities to win some great environmental prizes. Today, we are visiting Meadow Lily Woods. This is a really unique environmentally significant area and we're going to walk in today and, and see what we can see. Meadow Lily is a mixed forest area hugging the valley side of the South Thames River. There's some pretty amazing views that you can see from up here at Meadow Lily. April and May is the best time to see spring wildflowers in bloom. Lining the trail that I was walking across, I came upon these blooming trilliums and also these blooming trout lilies, which are really beautiful. Meadow lily is a great spot to see spring wildflowers. There's almost five kilometers of trails here. Also bridges that stretch across upland meadows, ravines and floodplains. I hope you're able to see this yellow-bellied sapsucker in the video. He's drinking some sap from this hickory tree.
we're ending our virtual visit of Meadow Lily ESA at this heritage property, which is uh, Meadow Lily Bridge. The original br bridge was built back in the 1850s and it was the crossing point for the uh, South Thames River. I hope you enjoyed your virtual visit to Meadow Lily. Please make sure that you're getting out and visiting London's ESAs. There's so many uh, opportunities and things to see right here within London and make sure you're uploading those photos to social media. See you next time. Great. Thanks, Andrea. Great video. I like the whispering so that the bird could be undisturbed. Um, so now we're just going to do uh, two minutes to uh, end our session the way we have uh, all month so far is to really focus on local groups that you can get to know, volunteer with, learn from. Uh, let's take a look at them now. I'm just going to bring up my slides. Right. Uh, so here we are. So, um, so today we're going to look at London Cycle Link. And it's a member supported nonprofit helping Londoners ride more uh, by building their confidence, advocating for safe streets and developing a thriving cycling community here in London through hosting events, teaching cycling skills, running campaigns and operating a community bike shop, the squeaky wheel. They work toward a healthy, vibrant London where it's safe and convenient for everyone to cycle. Ride your bike instead of driving. And if you'd like to volunteer, you can sign up to fix bikes plan events or advocate for safe streets, check out their website on the screen now. Next one is Friends of Stony Creek. The Friends of Stony Creek are a group of concerned citizens who work with the Upper Thames uh, River Conservation Authority, the City of London and the community itself to improve the health of Stony Creek. Since 1992, the Friends and their partners have been implementing hands-on stream rehabilitation projects along the creek creating educational opportunities and sharing their experience and knowledge. They host tree planting events annually, regular litter cleanups and other events throughout the year. And next year in 2022, the Friends celebrate 30 years of working together to protect the Stony Creek watershed. Uh, keep an eye on their Facebook page to events, uh, for events to celebrate this milestone. And our next groups, I will just go to our next slide here, stand by. Oh, I haven't even, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it even better now. Ah, there we go, that's nicer. Um, so we're going to go to our next two groups, last two, Climate Action London, a coalition of concerned Londoners who want to inspire, educate, and advocate for greater climate action in London and Middlesex County. Their goal is to engage every Londoner in some form of climate action while collaborating with organizations and government to address the climate crisis from a top-down approach. Find them on Facebook and Twitter, subscribe to their weekly newsletter that provides tips, actions, and information, join their monthly advocacy Zoom call where members share projects that are happening in London and organize ways to increase engagement and volunteer at some of their projects like creating a pollinator park, um, pollinator garden, excuse me, in Meredith Park, or uh, the online native plant sale that's happening right now. And lastly, Urban Roots, a nonprofit organization that revitalizes underused land in the city of London for agriculture by producing high quality organic vegetables and herbs, uh, distributing produce locally directly to consumers and to private and social enterprises and charity partners working to address food insecurity. They have lots of volunteer opportunities to connect with others on and sometimes off their farm. Regular uh, drop-in volunteer hours will start with their weekly markets in May. You can sign up for their volunteer list on their website. Thank you so much to all of these groups for the work that they do. So now I will um, just stop my screen here and hand it back to Andrea for a few last words. I, I'd just like to thank Paul for uh, joining us today. It's It's been surreal to have him here. Um, as I mentioned, it's it's been many years since we've we've really been in contact. So this is sort of a silver lining of Zoom where, or of the, the pandemic really, this Zoom life where we're able to have him joining us. Um, as a, another note, if you'd like to register for any of our programs, go to lpl.ca slash environmentalist, or you can find a link there to ask me any additional questions that maybe we didn't get to today. As a final reminder for our ESA challenge, please use that hashtag LDNESA on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and also share your selfies at one or more of those 
uh, environmentally significant areas that you're visiting throughout the month of April. We also hope that you log on for our next event on Saturday, April 24th from 2 to 3, which is our Healthy Shorelines and Riverbanks webinar featuring Tom Cole. He's returning uh, within this program. He's going to highlight his work with Antler excuse me, Antler River Rally. And we're also joined by Daniela Klipker, which is the Coastal Stewardship Coordinator at the Lake Huron Coastal Center. So thanks everybody uh, for sticking around a little bit late and joining us today. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next time.